Good evening and konbanwa from the International House of Japan. It is 5.30 in the evening here in Tokyo. A warm welcome to the very first session of the Leaders Shaping the Future of the Indo-Pacific Series. My name is Aiko Doden, Special Affairs Commentator at NHK World TV, also the trustee member at the International House of Japan. Thank you all for registering and for joining the session. Let me speak very, very briefly about the aim of this series we are launching this year in 2021. As we live through the pandemic, we have had to respond to this unprecedented challenge in our own way, no matter where we live. This virus is such that it forces us to be physically distant from each other and it prevents us from reaching out to people, meeting people, when comfort and encouragement are most needed. Now, there are concerns in the social and the global arena that the current situation can worsen division and give rise to anti-globalism, nationalism or racism that would negatively impact the willingness on the part of the people to come together and to work towards a shared goal. That is precisely why at the International House of Japan we have decided to launch this webinar to provide a platform for people to get together, to share their views and insights, and to demonstrate empathy and solidarity. Key figures who are making such a great difference in their own capacity in the region are invited to speak, to share with us their vision and um, experience. Uh, topics will be diverse from democracy and governance, education and human rights, architecture and smart city, and so on focusing on the issues that matter to us all today. Um, at webinars, uh, it is sad that we won't have uh, coffee breaks uh, where we can continue conversation or uh, take a walk in our beautiful um, Japanese garden at the International House of Japan. But uh, let's hope that, that we can all do that when the time is right. Our very first speaker today really requires no introduction. Audrey Tan. Taiwan's digital minister has graciously agreed to speak. Audrey Tan is, hello Audrey. Hello. Thank you very much for joining everyone. us. Thank you. Audrey Tan, as you know, is Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. She is best known as one of the central figures of Taiwan's antivirus efforts by implementing measures that made full use of IT as well as mask she's holding in an effort to bring virus under control. When she took office at 35, she was the youngest minister in Taiwan's history. And Minister Tan has um, come to be known as Taiwan's genius, but I know that, uh, she says, the active use of IT is not just to bring a virus under control, but that it is also about social innovation that shapes Taiwanese democracy, the Taiwan model. So Minister Audrey Tan, delighted to have you today and great to see you again. Very nice seeing you again uh, after half a year, right? Uh, right. If I remember correctly. Yes. Um, and I'm really happy to share uh, about the Taiwan model, which is, um, after all, a all of society model that stemmed from our collective memory of SARS in 2003. And as a result, is a people public private partnership where the best idea came from the social sector, such as mass creationing, uh, visualization, uh, as well as what I call humor over rumor. A lot of very memorable memes um, that okay. reminds people to wear a mask to protect ourselves from our own hands, things okay. like that. So as you say, it's not just about containing the virus, but it's, it's also about the social fabric, um, social cohesion. Would I be right in saying that? That's exactly right. Uh, our uh, modus operandi uh, is to fight the pandemic uh, with no lockdown and fight the infodemic with no takedown. Uh, lockdown or takedown might be, of course, necessary if things uh, spiral out of control. But in Taiwan, uh, in the past year, we've never had to declare a constitutional state of emergency, meaning that we've been operating under the normal democratic control with the parliamentary oversight interpolation and all that. And because of that, uh, we must work with the people, not just for the people, when it comes to all the measures that we must take during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. 
And latest COVID-19 situation in Taiwan shows um, 842 confirmed cases and seven deaths. Um, Taiwan's effort has made it one of the, the safest place on earth, people say. Um, many countries, including Japan, wonder um, what lessons can be learned from Taiwan. I think uh, first and foremost, this is all about the speed of the iteration of the measures. Uh, I call this fast, fair, and fun. The fast part uh, is built upon this daily press conferences that uh, the Central Epidemic Command Center answers each and every of journalists' questions until they run out of question of the day. But even after the live streamed press conference, anyone can call 1922, the toll-free number, as well as chatbots and so on, to ask follow-up questions. And the call center in more than 95% of the cases very quickly uh, gives a scientific explanation. And in the rare case, uh, like back in April, last year when a young boy called saying you're rationing out masks to me and all I get is pink medical mask, what am I to do? Uh, the very next day, next 2 p.m., all everybody in CECC wore pink uh, masks regardless of gender. And so this is a very fast iteration cycle that I think could be learned by pretty much any jurisdiction. Of course, the fairness, the equitable access to PPEs and the humor over rumor, these are also memorable points. Mm-hmm. But how is Taiwan reacting to this recent development of COVID-19 variants? Now, what are the measures being taken? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no matter how it mutates, I'm pretty sure the physical vaccine, uh, that's to say the mask, uh, will still work. <laughs> so we're all still wearing masks and washing our hands. That said, we did uh, decide to tighten our quarantine measures for travelers coming in from Taiwan. Actually, starting today, everyone uh, must either um, go to a quarantine hotel or a group quarantine facility made available, or if they decide to stay at their residence, they must uh, fulfill this one person per residence uh, it used to be per uh, like uh, flat with their own bathroom but now it's per residence uh, other than that uh, we've also um, tightened up penalties for people who get uh, noticed that uh, they're not wearing masks in the public crowded spaces and if they refuse to put on the mask there's now a fine so these are the uh, two more important measures for our winter measures mm -hmm. But um, you know, we, we've lived through this pandemic for about a year now. And, and I've spoken to you the previous time uh, about a half a year, year mm -hmm. ago. And I have felt that uh, perhaps just you know, mechanical social distancing won't be enough. You know, what I'm saying is, is that, uh, that there has to be some conscious understanding that protecting yourself means protecting others, you know, the loved ones, uh, the society essential worker. Um, would I be right in saying that? Definitely. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, we very interestingly uh, has a place where it's cheaper, less expensive to go to a pharmacy and get a mask and then go to a nearby clinic and get a diagnosis. It's even more uh, accessible and inexpensive than uh, the drive-through tests in other jurisdictions because of the single-payer healthcare system. And so we said that it's um, everyone's duty to take care of themselves, even if they develop uh, COVID-like symptoms, even if it's not COVID, it's still safer uh, to just go to a pharmacy to get a mask and go to a clinic to get a full check uh, just to protect everyone involved. But how come, um, how has Taiwanese people come to acquire that, develop that understanding mm -hmm. collectively. Yeah, I think this is uh, entirely, almost entirely because of our experience with the SARS in 2003. Everyone uh, above 30 years old remember how bad SARS was. Uh, and I remember like personally, the municipal government saying different things to the central government. It was quite chaotic. People rushed to panic by N95 and medical grade masks, uh, the barricading of the Hoping Hospital unannounced and so on. Uh, and so because I guess people above 30 years are still the majority of the population, people do remind each other the importance of wearing masks and washing hands and social distancing. Mm -hmm. And uh, vaccine obviously is good news, but um, we will all be safe only when you know, that there is fair and equal distribution around the world. Now, how does Taiwan seek to ensure its people that there will be a fair access to vaccine? 
Well, um, because that uh, single pay uh, uh, national health IC card covers 99.99% of citizens, not just citizens actually, but also residents, immigrant workers and so on, uh, we plan to use the same mask rationing ideas uh, to ensure a equitable access. Of course, that depends on the specific vaccines, like the temperature, the storage, the logistics and so on. Uh, so at the moment, I don't have like the algorithm uh, details, but it's very likely that it will be some something like the mass distribution, and it will be built upon single-payer national IC card of healthcare. So would you be making most of the, the scheme uh, enabled by IT? That's exactly right. Uh, the, um, especially the NHI, the National Health Insurance app, uh, saw more than tenfold uh, use downloads and so on uh, so that people understand that they can get uh, the real-time information uh, not only about mask and so on but actually about all their previous diagnosis their previous uh, visits to doctors and dentists and so on uh, all in a single app and this is a kind of new awareness enabled uh, by the pandemic in the Taiwanese people. Mm -hmm. Now, during our last conversation you have said that uh, IT is not a magic wand that no, IT not alone won't provide solution to problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if trust uh, between the government and the people is the integral part um, of what you call Taiwan model, how do you nurture that trust? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, IT only connects machines together. Right? Digital connects people together. Uh, and so I make the distinction because really, uh, if you look at the live stream conference or the toll-free number, the call center and so on, these are not very high-end IT, right? You, you only require a radio or a television station and a landline, a, a phone, right? So this is not cutting edge. On the other hand, the use uh, of these is cutting edge. So when, for example, uh, we first started rationing out masks in the beginning of February, um, there's a social innovation on the civic tech side that showed the availability of masks uh, in the uh, form of a map. On the other hand, the pharmacists also innovated among themselves and invented take a number system where they collect the IC card on the morning, hand them the numbers and tell the citizens to go back in the evening in return to their uh, IC card back uh, with their allotted uh, masks. So that they can process uh, the IC card during the lunch break. Now, individually, these are great social innovations, but taken together, this is like Mentos plus Coca-Cola. It uh, explodes because <laughs> on the uh, mask map, you will see the pharmacies that hand out take number systems uh, like sell nothing on the morning and sells everything during the lunch break, <laughs> right? And so for a long time, uh, it will be inaccurate so much so that there's a nearby pharmacy uh, near my resident that simply said in the front of its window saying, don't trust the app. Now, of course, we had to adjust and we did adjust by listening to the pharmacist. But first, we apologized like very swiftly, like the next day, and then uh, show the competence of uh, taking in the suggestion from the pharmacist, namely on the map display uh, one field for the collection of numbers and one field for the collection of the mask. And we rolled out the very next Thursday. And eventually, a couple of Thursdays from then, we started brainstorming how to make it even more accurate so that we uh, invented a system where the pharmacy can press a button and disappear from the map soon as they uh, hand out all their numbers for the day and so on. So those two research innovations start working together. So I would say that first, the collective intelligence have a way to listen and scale a rapid response cycle and apologize when there is a incompetence uh, discovered and then show the competence to uh, remedy that within the next iteration cycle, in our case, within the next so s social participation, the civic participation sounds like the key mm -hmm. uh, and um, both the government and the, the public do have to, to be careful um, because such trust can be eroded so fast when mm -hmm. something goes wrong. That's right. Hmm. Yes. See, and some people are still skeptical, though, um, with regards to the use of IT. They say IT can work negatively in perhaps creating a further digital divide, or social media can also become a tool that um, you know, deepens polarization you know, in a democracy. Um, how do you try and find a balance between reaching a, a consensus, uh, but also respecting the, the views of the minority? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, for example, when we started rationing out the masks, uh, there's a lot of people's suggestion uh, that those real name uh, rationing can be implemented on top of mobile payment systems. On the other hand, because the elderly and the people who are less um, effective with their mobile phones probably are not going to enroll in that, uh, the numbers show that if we implement that instead of the National Health IC card, then we will only reach about half of the population. But in order in order for the R value to be under one, uh, we really need more than three quarter of the population wearing masks and washing their hands. So we did not use mobile payment as a real name rationing system, but instead uh, chose to work with the community pharmacists who do have the trust for their communities. And more importantly, the elderly people already know how to refill their prescriptions. Uh, and so we designed the process to work exactly as the familiar process that the elderly people uh, already had uh, with the pharmacists. So this spirit is to bring technology to the people instead of asking the people to adapt to technology. This is called appropriate technology. And then uh, we work also on pro-social messaging like humor over rumor so that we are not stuck uh, with the more anti-social side of social media but can build our own pro-social side of the digital public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of bundled two questions into one and, and the latter part of my question about uh, in a democracy system, if democracy is all about consensus, building a consensus, how do you balance consensus and um, respecting the views of the minority? Mm -hmm. I think uh, one key insight is that there's more than one way to do it, uh, to do digital service delivery. Uh, when Howard Wu from Tainan City shared the mask rationing map, availability map, that's one way to do it. But then Fin Jin Kyung built another map out of OpenStreetMap technology. Uh, very quickly, many other people, such as uh, Frank from the HTC DeepQ team, built a chatbot uh, that is more friendly for people who are more used to the line uh, ecosystem. Uh, and then uh, people build voice assistants that speak different languages, as well as um, so-called uh, analysis dashboards uh, for the planners out there and so on. And so at the end, there's more than 140 different applications based on the same real-time data of mask availability. And so we understand that uh, no single app can fulfill the need of every population. On the other hand, because the open API is there for everyone to use. Anyone who think of a different application can just go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. um, more broadly about the system uh, within um, the democracy, um, like in Taiwan, um, the, the country, the, Taiwan has legalized mm -hmm. the same-sex marriage, for mm -hmm. example. Um, how did you balance the, the consensus versus the uh, views of the minority? Actually, there is a consensus uh, when it comes to the one constitutional court ruling and the two referendum on this matter, in that uh, pretty much everyone is okay with marriage equality that marries the uh, bylaw relationship, that is just the individual to individuals. But many people are not okay with the in-law relationship, that is to say the family to family relationships. Um, just like in Japan, right? When two persons wed, their families also wed. Uh, and for uh, marriage equality, what we have done is uh, innovate. Just like um, Taiwan is caught between the Eurasian plate on uh, one side uh, and the Philippine Sea plate on the other, and they bump into each other and uh, Taiwan raises, like literally the top of Taiwan raises two and a half centimeters every year. Uh, we see the tension between the uh, individual to individual view and the family to family view. And when they bump together, we innovate and say, hey, let's legalize marriage equality by saying for homosexual couples, they only wed as individuals marrying the bylaws, but not their families, that is not the in-laws. And that's... Um, made everybody happier, if not perfectly happy. It's not a uh, like very fine consensus, but it's a rough consensus that everybody can live with. And so the key is to find common values that unites those different positions together. Hmm. But how do you balance inclusion and diversity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, inclusion to me uh, means making sure that the diverse values and diverse uh, sounds and voices of the people are um, taken in a way, as I mentioned it, uh, in a way that's taking all the sides. 
So we personally uh, tour around Taiwan, prompted by social innovators, youth advisors, our reverse mentors, and so on. And for each of those controversial issues, instead of just saying, hey, there's a diverse um, representative, we make sure that each representative can actually tour around the multiple stakeholders and take all the sides and argue things from the different viewpoints of the different affected uh, stakeholders. And only then can we uh, synthesize their views and deliver the sort of innovation that works better for everyone. Mm -hmm. Why is um, diversity and inclusion both so important to Taiwan? Uh, in Taiwan, we have more than 20 national languages. That is to say, uh, we have more than 20 ways of interpreting history, uh, of interpreting the society that we all live in. On the other hand, all those 20 plus coaches agree on basic things, such as the single payer health system, uh, the universal access to education and broadband as human right and so on. And so there are a lot of work put into the transcultural point of view. That is to say, I'm not only bound by the culture that I'm born into, but I can uh, choose any of the other uh, 20 or so cultures uh, in Taiwan and view the same policy making through the different lens of those cultural identities. So we wouldn't make progress that only work for one single culture at the expense of the other cultures. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little, about, a little bit about the, the teaching from your mother, uh, which you often quote that each and every culture has its own unique value. One is neither superior nor inferior to others. Now, would I be say in understanding that in essence it is a message about creating a society that is both diverse and inclusive? I think that is an excellent summary um, and um, Basically, uh, the message uh, is this, um, what we have uh, is a transcultural republic of citizens. Uh, and by citizens, I mean people actively participating in the polity. So not just uh, like people in general, but people who are part of the civic or the social sector. Mm -hmm. Is that how um, civic participation is encouraged and strengthened? Definitely. Uh, instead of saying, hey, you have to be 18 or 20 years old uh, to participate in democracy, actively um, contributing to elections and so on. Um, in Taiwan, actually, people who are as young as 15 or 16 are actually the most active. They are responsible for, for uh, more than, I think, one quarter of all the petitions uh, start in the uh, join.gov, the TWR national e-petition system for things like, you know, banning the plastic straw and things like that. Uh, and so I think even for the very young people, actually, maybe especially the very young people, uh, they are less burdened by the business as usual, the usual way of doing things, and they care a lot more uh, about the future and the sustainability and so on. So they form natural alliance with people who are like 70 or 80 years old. Uh, the both age groups care the most about the long-term future. Mm. Would you call that Taiwan model as well? Well, I would say yes, definitely. Taiwan model is fundamentally about people, public, private partnership. The order is important. So anything that is led by the social sector that has people working with the public sector and then the public sector amplifying and then working with the private sector, I would say it uh, shines through uh, the Taiwan model for not just really pandemic or infodemic, but also on climate change and other uh, issues. Uh -huh. Um, has the, the, the teaching from your mother, the idea, uh, had an impact on you in encouraging civic participation and in creating a society or a system where everyone has a say? Yeah, definitely. My earliest uh, memory uh, was my mom uh, like co-founding a environmental uh, group, the Homemakers Union, and they later on uh, formed a uh, consumer cooperative and uh, work a lot uh, with participatory accountability for organic farming and other environmental friendly uh, agricultural products and things like that. So I guess I, I'm immersed uh, by osmosis in the cooperative, um, nowadays we call it a platform cooperative uh, infrastructure that's part of our social sector. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about the, the way forward, um, we say, you know, we are all in this pandemic together, but um, disparity and inequality still persist, you know, even when you know, we all have to work collectively to tackle the pro problem. 
Um, what are the challenges and opportunities um, facing us as we live the new normal? Yeah, we're very fortunate in that Dr. Simon promised and we delivered broadband as a human right uh, in her first term uh, as a president. Uh, because if not for the fact that more than 90% of pharmacies have fiber optic lines to the national health insurance, uh, we will probably not be able <laughs> to update the mass rationing in real time or process those IC cards in such a swift and efficient fashion. Uh, and so broadband as a human right really is a challenge. And we see during the pandemic in jurisdictions that do not have broadband as a human right, uh, not only do the health suffers, but also learning, but also civic participation or really just a livability uh, suffers. So that's the main challenge. And then opportunities that grows out of broadband as a human right is definitely more international cross-discipline and transcultural collaboration. Because once you have broadband as a human right, in addition to the knowledge sharing that we are now doing, you can share a lot lot more uh, with broadband. You can share the uh, place you live in. You can co-create in virtual reality. You can uh, form long-term like relations uh, through the virtual reality and augmented reality and things like that. And I become a much more regular user of VR technologies uh, during the pandemic, even uh, co-creating art uh, with people in the museum and so on uh, using this uh, XR space, which has a built-in 5G chip and can be controlled by hand gesture alone without a controller. And uh, my latest uh, art co-creation was uh, on the virtual uh, tip, the peak of the Matterhorn Mountain in Switzerland. And so that shows the possibilities of transcultural relationships across the virtual and augmented realities. No, um, in spite of the fact that uh, we have been in this pandemic for over a year now, um, you, your forward-looking um, thinking uh, and uh, almost optimism, uh, mm -hmm. wh where does that come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of this optimism comes from the visible impact of each and every small suggestions made by the social innovators in Taiwan. It could be about pink masks, about rainbow masks. It could be about using traditional rice cookers uh, to cure the virus but doesn't cure the mask uh, and things like that. And very swiftly, they get amplified through the CECC, through the social sector, and through everyone in collaboration. Even the uh, business district in the nightlife uh, district, like the host and hostess boss, uh, were part of the counter-pandemic team by co-creating the real contact system where the patrons are still anonymous from the uh, state, from the government, but still uh, leaves a like prepaid SIM card or a throwaway email address that allow them to be contacted. And if there's no local outbreak for four weeks and it all gets shredded and so on. So it's this very simple co-creation with the people, not just for the people that gives me the optimism that the democracy is indeed deepening, even during the infodemic and pandemic. So do you think um, making a paradigm shift in the global pandemic is possible? Yes, it is. And it shows the direction of, as I mentioned, transcultural, uh, international, and also across age groups, uh, intergenerational solidarity. Uh -huh. See, thank you. Thank you, Minister Tan. Um, I think um, we have uh, questions from the audience as well. Um, the, the first question, um, I have my notes here, um, I will read it to you, uh, comes from um, our International House Nitobe Fellow, uh, Hiroyuki Yakshi, Director Planning and TCAT Process Division, Africa Department, JICA, Japan International Corporation Agency. Now, what um, role can digital technology and innovation can play in building a resilient society? Um, you know, many people around the world have lost their jobs, you know, educational opportunities and hopes due to this COVID crisis. The impact on the poor and vulnerable groups such as women and children is particularly serious. Now, what is your thoughts of the role that digital technology and innovation can contribute to um, empowering those vulnerable groups? What would you say? 
Well, in our experience, especially on the stimulus part uh, in the Taiwan's playbook, that is to say, uh, after we moved from the alleviation part to the stimulus part, the very young, uh, as well as the especially uh, women entrepreneurs of small and medium enterprises uh, that are, of course, the hardest hit, but they show the most resilience and are the most eager and capable uh, in learning digital technologies. The government not only provides Uh, the stipends such as the uh, triple stimulus vouchers that encourages uh, those face-to-face um, um, commerce uh, to resume uh, after everyone uh, gets uh, used to the online e-commerce and delivery. Uh, we say, you no, know, if you go out uh, and shop uh, like face-to-face uh, for $3,000, the state reimburses uh, two-thirds of that back. And it's very popular. Almost everyone in Taiwan, uh, as well as people with permanent residence certificates uh, enjoy the use of the triple stimulus vouchers. But again, this is built upon our uh, decades-long digital opportunity center programs, our digital companionship programs, our extent of the women entrepreneurship support through the uh, small and medium enterprise agency and so on. So I think uh, what really pays uh, is to invest in such digital public infrastructures uh, during the time before the pandemic so that people still feel that they could Uh, digitally transformed during the pandemic and know already a group of people, uh, the mentors and so on that they can reach out to. So such um, social infrastructures are also very much worth investing after all of us get vaccinated uh, in any jurisdiction. Um, in our previous conversation, you said that, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember it correctly, but um, you know, every, every rock has a crack Mm-hmm. and that the light can shine through. Yes, uh, there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. It's from Leonard Cohen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, can you elaborate that for us? Definitely. Um, so um, the full quote uh, from the singer-songwriter Leonard Cohen was, and I quote, uh, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in, unquote. Now, uh, To me, forget your perfect offering. Uh, this stands out. Once I learn about it, it cures my perfectionism. Uh, I used to uh, be a little bit uh, perfectionist, uh, and I don't easily uh, share my work until it's uh, polished. But after I learned this from Lenico, and I'm like, yeah, of course, I'll just publish the imperfect ideas. And then, of course, people uh, will uh, offer criticism, but then I would just invite people who criticize, for example, as I mentioned, uh, the pharmacist that criticize the mask availability map or vice versa uh, into our co-creation team. And that's how the light gets in because without a imperfect copy to work from, there really is no way for the public to co-create. Um, thank you. And the next question is from um, Jaideep Hardikar, who is a freelance journalist in India, also iHouse Asia Leadership Fellow Program Fellow. Um, He says, in the 1960s and 1970s, the developing world faced issues with regard to communication imbalances driven by control of the West over satellite technology. Today, it is the data highways that are controlled by a few corporations, which in turn virtually control our lives and privacy on all spheres and aid the regimes. Uh, And the, the regimes in power in different countries are tinkering with the very notion of democracy. Do you think we need a broad global regulatory regime with nation-specific protocols to bring some semblance of rights and justice for the citizenry? How are you dealing with it in Taiwan? Right. If the question frames it as a privacy uh, issue, uh, I'm not sure that it is truly controlled by just a few corporations. I mean, we are using Cisco WebEx uh, at the moment, but we could as easily use, I don't know, GC Meet, um, uh, Acer as Meet, right? Uh, Or um, Microsoft Teams or or any of those uh, suppliers. And there's many uh, free software open source alternatives as well to the Cisco WebEx technology that we are using. Um, And I I say this because in Taiwan, uh, for example, Dr. Li Wenliang from Wuhan's message that there were, and I quote, seven SARS cases uh, discovered, unquote, was disseminated in Taiwan, not on Facebook, not on Twitter, not even online, uh, but on PTT, uh, which is the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit. Uh, And the PTT uh, belongs 
firmly in the social sector because it's not a company. It doesn't have shareholders. It's literally like students' pet projects uh, that runs for decades uh, from the National Taiwan University. And it's um, all the infrastructure is essentially uh, subsidized uh, by the university and the ministries of education uh, and science and technology. And so what I'm trying to get at is that if we debate and deliberate in the public spaces uh, like the, the Hyde Park, right, or uh, in my office, the social innovation lab, which is also a park, uh, then people expect to behave in a way uh, as the public infrastructures. Uh, on the other hand, if people debate about public issues and deliberate uh, in private uh, companies' spaces, that would be like holding a town hall in a uh, drinking bar that sells addictive um, advertisements or addictive liquors uh, and things like that. And it would be a, a kind of misuse uh, of the sort of the private sector's basis for public infrastructure purposes. And so I think uh, because Taiwan has a very legitimate, very strong social sector, so I'm more optimistic on this regard, but I do agree in jurisdictions where the uh, public infrastructure are essentially uh, taken over by private institutions, then we do need to think about how to expand uh, the governing mechanisms to make for more cooperative governing, as well as to make more choices based on free software movement principles. Mm -hmm. um, I, I sense that the JITIP might be concerned with the, 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 the powerful countries have, having certain amount of control over information or, or it can often be a few, uh, just a handful number of uh, corporations uh, which can become an actually powerful. What, what would you say to that? Uh, the same answer I gave to the diversity and inclusion uh, question, right? There is a diversity in the choices uh, and it is the social sector as well, I guess, the public sector's job uh, to contribute uh, to them. In Taiwan, for example, the joint platform for e-petition, that is entirely social sector and it's what I call pro-social media because the replies are in two columns, both supporting and maybe a different uh, opinion to the petitioner, but there's no way to reply uh, to each other in a thread or uh, call each other names and as a result of that deliberate design there's no way for trolls to grow uh, and if more um, public institutions use public infrastructure design for social interaction then the corporates will also get pressured to be more uh, publicly minded in the feature set uh, and algorithmic accountability and transparency uh, that they offer but if you do not have viable alternatives then of course the negotiations with those uh, global corporations are not that easy at all. So viable alternatives in the public sphere using free software principles hosted down to the metal level uh, in the places that we trust, like the National Center for High-Speed Computation and so on, that is necessary uh, as a response to Jaideep's question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have uh, questions from the, the audience who've registered for this event. Um, I have uh, four questions so far with me here, but I think we have time for more than four. Um, the, the first question would be, um, could you elaborate on why uh, you are interested in local initi initiatives and in what ways can they be connected to global initiatives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think the local initiatives uh, are the most important because just as I mentioned, the pharmacists who serve mostly their local community have the most trust. They are the most trustworthy when it comes to medical advices. Uh, imagine if we roll out mass rationing first in convenience stores. The staff in convenience stores uh, are probably less trusted even if they uh, share the same information about hand sanitation and appropriate mask use and so on. Uh, and so a local legitimacy infrastructure built upon daily interactions uh, with the respected experts and so on. I think this is fundamental for the social sector to grow. On the other hand, because broadband is a human right, all the pharmacists have access to the latest information by the Central Epidemic Command Center and their counterparts in international scientific community. And whenever there is a new invention happening, uh, they could also share it uh, with their own Line, like digital counterparts uh, that connects people together regardless of their actual physical distance. Uh, and so I would argue that if the social sector grows strongly locally, then the uh, activists would not feel alone in their endeavor and they're much more empowered to then connect to the global community with something to contribute. 
And the next question um, is, um, though it has created turmoil and tragedies, it could also be said that this pandemic has made people aware of other people's feelings. I hope digital technology will be used to convey people's mind and feelings. What do you think would be desirable changes in how SNS will operate in the future? Yeah, I, I think uh, the pandemic really changes uh, the way SNS is used because uh, showing off for example, is considered uh, inappropriate now during the pandemic, and I hope for good, right? So uh, the SNS as status symbols uh, is replaced by reminding each other to stay healthy, to stay safe, to live long and prosper, uh, and so on. So the more uh, pro-social work of the social uh, networks, I think that is definitely uh, what we see in the zeitgeist during the pandemic. Now, going forward, I think this will also be used uh, to bring more solidarity to for example, the climate crisis and things like that to bring people who suffer the more uh, from the climate crisis to people who maybe uh, live in places that are less affected and so on. And so I think, yeah, indeed, uh, this is a groundbreaking change. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to ask a follow-up question, um, in, in what way do, do you think um, the digital technology can contribute to, to tackling global issues, including the, the climate crisis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, the dashboards, uh, the maps, and so on, uh, things that makes it possible for data collisions and collaboratives to form is essential in Taiwan. We have a lot of primary schoolers uh, just working on air quality measurements and so on, using very inexpensive air boxes that together form a distributed ledger that forms the backbone of our civil IoT system, sci.taiwan.gov.tw. And when everyone is a data steward, everyone can learn not just about literacy, but also competence, how to make use of the numbers, how to tell the stories uh, based on those numbers, how to make art uh, to from those numbers on visualization and communication and things like that, which were very difficult to teach uh, if you work in a literacy mindset, but very easy, actually, if everyone is a producer of media and of data. And the, the next question is, what do you think would be the hardest challenge for you to tackle in the next coming five years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the issues uh, that is very, very difficult is, as I mentioned, the shift from literacy, which is uh, ultimately a radio and television style, uh, one way mass media communication to uh, competence, which is listening at scale. Uh, because in all the different jurisdictions, there are already existing hierarchical infrastructures that's more designed in a way that's top down. And of course, it used to be the vertical uh, hierarchies and communications were the most effective before the wide use of mobile internet and uh, broadband as a human right. But nowadays we exist in a space where it's actually um, more uh, easy to broadcast to non-specific people and then listen at scale uh, rather than to choose specific people on your vertical report line to communicate uh, with. And so this uh, shift from the more vertical uh, way of intelligence um, and uh, command line, right, command chain to work uh, to a more broad augmented and assistive collective intelligence. This is the uh, way that the society is indeed shifting, but the larger institutions such as the government, if they they do not make the uh, digital transformation this way, then they may be rendered less relevant uh, than if they were before. Mm -hmm. Talking about the, the hierarchy within the system, um, I understand uh, you have introduced the, the reverse mentor system. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate? Yes, exactly. So, um, yeah, for uh, the, I think we are at the, the third uh, assembly of the youth advisors, the reverse mentors to the cabinet now. Um, and each reverse mentor is mentoring uh, one or more of our cabinet ministers. Uh, they are always under 35 years old, uh, and they point the new directions for the ministry to work with. Uh, it could be, for example, um, reviving cooperative structures 
in the time of social innovation and platform economy. It could be, for example, for the world skills um, competition champions to enjoy the same uh, National Day celebration as well as the integration to the university courses and also basic education as the Olympic athletes uh, and things like that. And once they point out the direction, uh, we work with the ministers who are older. I'm older than 35, right? So the older ministers work with the younger reverse mentors to both learn from those new uh, policy directions and how to engage the public and then implement using the resources that the ministries have. And so I think this is a great way uh, for intergenerational solidarities to form because the young people do not just criticize, right? They bring uh, viable new directions. Mm -hmm. But that might be considered the revolutionary or even radical in many Asian countries where Mm -hmm. seniority or the hierarchy matter mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Had there been any um, like mm -hmm. negative reaction from uh, the, the people in the system? Well, the trick is that uh, in Taiwan too, of course, we yield uh, to seniority as a norm, but we yield also actually more uh, to written regulations. So the point is that we need to institutionalize it and write a very formal regulation that calls the reverse mentors not any informal um, names, but they are actually cabinet advisors. Right. And so uh, people yield to their institutionalized position uh, once they are known as cabinet advisors. Then, of course, we yield to their position uh, and the seniority is of a second concern. But if we do not have a very solid regulation to enable them in their position, then, of course, seniority and other characteristics enter the picture. Does that also mean that uh, the conventional wisdom um will not provide uh, all of the solutions in the new normal? Uh, I think conventional wisdom is very important in making sure that the inclusion part, that is to say this idea will be integrated into the social norm, but we also need radical social innovations uh, in both the, of course, more visible natural science and applied technology for industry, but also for the social sciences and novel ways to organize people together. I think these two uh, are like the, you know, right and the left wing of an airplane uh, and that uh, together it balances uh, the need for conserving the conventional wisdom as well as the need to react to emergent phenomena. And then another, another question from the viewers. Um, how do you keep your calm posture in the midst of turmoil? Mm, I sleep for eight hours or more every night. And, and that's it? And that's it. <laughs> um, but, but your work must keep you terribly busy, though. Uh, that's right. But uh, after work, I don't uh, bring my laptop uh, or my iPad uh, to the uh, residence uh, in my day-to-day -day work. And so I, I'm not uh, captured by the touch screen. I'm not a perma work uh, person. And so uh, if I don't have time to sleep for eight hours that night, maybe I sleep only seven, and then I make sure that I sleep for one hour during the lunch nap. Uh, but most of the time, I think six days out of seven a week, I do sleep for more than uh, eight hours and that ensures a calm integration of the various positions that I hear during the day into a cohesive uh, integrated value when I wake up. Okay. Another question. Um, with various information at hand, how do you select the right ones and make a decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think the most important thing here is to crowdsource the intelligence. We make sure that people crowd moderate uh, similar to the join uh, petition system where people can upvote and downvote uh, any ideas. We use POLIS, which is also upvoting and downvoting, P-O-L-I-S. The gov.tw is now part of our government public infrastructure, but it's also a free software uh, project that's uh, freely available uh, to any um, social sector organizations. So using POLIS, the best ideas are not the one that get most votes, but rather the best idea are the ones that resonate with the most diverse groups of people. And if you design the algorithm to reflect this rough consensus, only people who propose ideas that work across aisles will be highlighted. And that is how we solved, for example, the uh, UberX regulatory dilemma back in 2015, and also how we worked uh, to open up our mountains, open up our 
oceans and so on, all thanks to this listening as skill AI assistive intelligence conversation tool. Mm -hmm. Another question. Um, what would you do if you would like to make amends with people who are hostile or aggressive to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I thank them for their contribution. I uh, appreciate uh, their novel and creative use uh, of language. Uh, and then I invite them to co-create the most uh, likely question I will ask uh, to actually a um, upset pharmacist at the beginning of mass rationing is, what would you do if you are the digital minister? Uh, and then uh, they actually offer some really good ideas. Um, another question, which is quite long, as one of the world's greatest thinkers in STEM and a person who identifies on the non-normative gender and sexuality mm -hmm. spectrum, how do you see the relationship between personal identity and science, given that conventional wisdom seems to regard science as neutral and value-free? Can you please comment on the role of a uh, future of... Uh, diversity um, on the part of science as you see it? Yeah, uh, I get asked uh, this a lot, like uh, you're a digital minister, how can you to be non-binary? Um, so I often uh, remind people that digital uh, comes from digits and I have 10 digits, right? It's decimal, it's definitely not binary. Uh, and so um, being a digital minister, uh, I see digital, uh, which in Mandarin uh, is the same as plural, uh, is more than one. There's more than one way to do it. There's more than two possibilities when it comes to uh, gender, and there's more than 10, I guess, uh, different cultures and national languages in Taiwan. So uh, my main uh, approach to STEAM, uh, because I uh, add art, uh, also the creative field to it, which include also design um, to it, uh, I approach STEAM with the idea of uh, taking all the sides again. Uh, I think STEAM is this great um, canvas top of which that everybody held a piece of the puzzle and only by completing each other's puzzles can we actually have a overview on the actual picture uh, in science, technology, engineering, art, and also in mathematics. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I, I think um, time, time is almost up. Um, I'd like to ask one question to you, uh, Minister Tan. Um, mm -hmm. People say this pandemic has been a, a wake up call in many ways. Um, what, what do you think we are waking up to? Mm -hmm. I think we are waking up to a planetary uh, solidarity. That is to say, for the first time, we are facing the same issue that is of common urgency, regardless of where you are on the planet. No one is left behind. No one is uh, exempted uh, from this um, issue, not even the Antarctica, uh, evidently. Uh, and so because of that, uh, now that we form a planetary uh, workforce um, to tackle a common issue, we can extend that to tackle infodemic, to tackle climate change, to tackle the digital governance issues that people brought up. And we will uh, work on that with renewed solidarity across cultures and uh, nations and uh, generations. Um, one follow-up question from the um, audience. Um, your, your idea, it's, it's a very practical question. Minister's idea, fast, fair, fun, is what I think Japan needs to know, uh, needs now. Um, how do you make your citizens understand it and change their behavior in Taiwan? Um, we make sure that it's not just me uh, who spread those ideas. We have uh, people responsible for engagement, the participation officers in each and every ministry. Uh, and uh, maybe the questioner already know the answer, but I will share it anyway. The participation officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, lives uh, with the dog, a Shiba Inu. And so uh, instead of the PL themselves uh, making the public speeches, it is the very cute uh, Shiba Inu, the name is Zong Chai, making such announcements such as when you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inus away and outdoor two Shiba Inus away, wear a mask to protect yourself against your own unwashed hands uh, and things like that. And so work with humor, making sure that the humor has a higher R value above rumor. And before long, the citizens will start remixing those um, ideas in the commas and the ideas will spreading will spread faster. Thank you. That, that would be something that we should remember 
as we fight through this uh, pandemic. Um, I have nothing more to, to add than to thank uh, Minister Tan for generously making the time for this webinar and to all the participants for, for joining this webinar. Um, our, our conversation um, reminds us that uh, neither IT nor vaccination alone can put an end to the spread of the virus. Uh, the pandemic, no doubt, will continue to be a challenge for all of us. But as Minister Tan elaborated, uh, we can turn this into an opportunity, perhaps, to work towards a more resilient and caring world where no one is left behind. And I do hope that uh, we will make uh, some progress into that direction this year, in year 2021. So uh, please give a big virtual round of applause to Minister Audrey Tan. Thank you very much. Live long and prosper. Thank you. Um, that would bring us to the end of the conversation with the Minister Audrey Tan. Um, we've covered quite a bit uh, and there's uh, so much uh, to take away from this conversation today. Um, I'd like to thank the co-organizers and sponsors. I uh, would like to thank the, um, the, this series is made possible by Asia Society Japan Center, Mitsubishi UFJ Research and Consulting, Shahani Associates, the Japan Foundation Asia Center, MRA Foundation, Tanaka UK Japan Educational Foundation. And our next session is scheduled for uh, next week on January the 21st, uh, 22nd from uh, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock Japan Standard Time. And the topic will be on education in the COVID-19 world. We will have a video message from um, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Malala Yousafzai, and speakers include Ms. Lin Kobayashi, who is co-founder and chair of the board, uh, United World College, Isaac, Japan, and Ms. Kathy Matsui, board member of Asian University for Women Support Foundation. So thank you all for joining the session. Please stay safe and healthy. I hope that uh, you will join us again next week. Thank you and goodbye from Tokyo.